Back here on Open, the Trump administration was recently blocked by federal judge William Orrick from enforcing threats to withhold funds from sanctuary cities. This comes as a response to a lawsuit filed by Santa Barbara County. Now, judge Orrick found many discrepancies in the executive order and he found it unconstitutional. Former national security advisor Michael Flynn also may have broken the law by not disclosing his involvement with Russia while seeking security clearance to work in the White House. Here now to talk all about these latest topics, we welcome now attorney and uh, political commentator, J.C. Polanco. Good morning. How are Good you? Good to have you. Thanks for having me. All I love well. being here. Good. Well, let's get right into it as we talk about the uh, latest executive order that was blocked by uh, the judge in Santa Barbara. Of course, a lot of people concerned about the whole sanctuary city. Your thoughts to uh, the ruling? Well, I have to tell you, the president has had a very steep learning curve these first hundred days. I know that his campaign style was very interesting and we analyzed it a great deal here. It was more like a, I'm a Superman and I'm going to get all these things done because this is what I say. But when he gets into office, he soon realizes that that's not exactly how it works. You have to deal with Congress. You have to deal with Congress members. You have to deal with caucuses. And yes, you have to deal with the federal courts. And the federal courts time after time continue to deal a blow uh, to this president. Now, what's interesting is how this president's actions are causing uh, a kind of revolution in political discussion across the country. I mean, you have children talking about politics and, and the role of government and the different levels of government. And one thing I want Bronxites to know is that this federal court system is very interesting. Uh, the federal court system is broken up into districts across the country. And the reason it's broken up that way is because different regions of the country have some cultural affinities and resemblances. For mm -hmm. example, in the West Coast, you're going to have a much more liberal uh, population than you would, for example, in Texas. Mm -hmm. So the federal district court out in, in California and in the West Coast will be very different from the South. Now, one thing is interesting, in any one of these federal district court judges, when they make their decisions, it affects the whole country. So President Trump promised sanctuary cities. President Trump promised that we were going to withhold funding of sanctuary cities. And those are cities that do not report undocumented immigrants to the federal government or work with ICE mm -hmm. to get these people deported. Turns out that a judge in Hawaii, a judge in Washington state, has the power to stop a president's action nationwide. Now, I think that's very interesting, and I think you're going to see the President Trump take to Twitter attacking these judges for making these decisions. How can a judge, uh, Sessions said just last week, out in an island in the Pacific, change the decision of the sitting president of the United States? So you're going to, Bronx sites are going to see a lot of these decisions made by the president be stopped at the federal court level. Now, this is where it changes. Uh, once a district court makes a decision, it has to go up to the Court of Appeals and then ultimately it will make it to the Supreme Court. I think President Trump has the votes on the Supreme Court to overturn these district decisions out in the West Coast. How long would that take? Because a lot of people talk about that process. It would make its way to the Supreme Court. We know that there would be appeals and the White House has not said exactly what they would appeal yet. How long could we be seeing before they make its way to the Supreme Court? Because some people say it might take, you know, it might take months. This could take years. Well, it could. It all depends on the judges and as to whether or not the Supreme Court justices grant cert to, to review these cases. Now, it could be something like a travel ban that is imminent, that affects people right away and that affects the economy in such a way that the justices feel this needs to get a hearing right away. But normally it takes a, a, a while and we've seen that with marriage equality. We've seen that with Obamacare. These things take a while before they make it to the Supreme Court of the United States. But I have to tell you this, I think that there are going to be many decisions that the president is going to make unilaterally in these executive orders that are going to be overturned at the district level. And that is simply because of the cultural differences that exist at these district court levels. And I think that's interesting. And I think Bronxites are getting a little flavor now of what they missed out on those social studies class they were sleeping through all these years. <laughs> well, let's talk about the, the judge in this particular case. Uh, judge William Oryk says, uh, he was, uh, was, uh, sided with Santa Clara County, saying that he does not find the policy unconstitutional, but he did find that the counties and cities that challenged the law uh, demonstrated that they could face irreparable harm. Yes, and that's because the funding is so important. See, New York City receives billions of dollars from the federal government. If that money were to be withheld, then we would end up uh, uh, experiencing incredible harm when it comes to our NYPD, to it comes to our human and social services. So we need that money. Now, the question is, do cities, and I think Bronx sites, I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, let's think about this for a second. Mm -hmm. Do cities have the right to ignore federal law. I think that's going to be a topic 
for the Supreme Court. And to add to that, can the federal government punish local governments for not complying with the law? And I think they can. All the Bronxites have to do is look at the interstate highway system. Uh, if New York, for example, does not abide by a 55 mile per hour speed limit or a 65 mile per hour speed limit as the federal government and the president wish, they can withhold funding to fix those roads. So the federal government does have power to force state and local governments to act in a certain matter. And that very, uh, a lot of times uh, is withholding funds. Mm -hmm. So I think this is going to be interesting. You talk about New York State, let's come a little bit closer to home and talk about what's going on here in New York. Obviously the raise the age uh, passed and a lot of people uh, in New York excited about the raise the age. Your perspective? Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Republican and uh, I want Bronxites to just hear me out for a second. This raise the age idea seems very noble. Juveniles that commit crimes should not face adult times. That's the idea and it, and it seems very good on paper. But not as a, as a, as a bipartisan or as a nonpartisan uh, analyst, uh, from a different perspective, I think it is a problem for us to include violent criminals in that 16 and 17 year old process of raise the age. Now, it already passed and I know the governor's gonna sign it and it will be law. But I know for a fact that our communities are, are continuously suffering at the hands of people in our communities that create violent environments and violent atmospheres and beat other people up and jump other people and use their hands and may not use a gun. And these 16 and 17 year olds that attack these moms and dads going to the bodega uh, are going to find themselves doing juvenile time for what is an adult crime. If you read the law, the law states that a violent crime includes crimes that involve weapons. Well, you can rape and sexually assault and attack a person not using a weapon. And if you're 16 and 17, uh, these legislators, and I know a lot of them are my friends and they're watching and they're angry at me right now, and that's okay. But these legislators would want you to believe that a 16 and a 17 year old that's committing these violent crimes is a juvenile. That's very different from the kid that goes into Macy's and shoplifts to face adult time for that and to have that on his record for a long time we can have that debate and I would probably argue that that's a minor crime but when we're talking about violent crimes when we're talking about sexual assaults when we're talking about hurting other people and you're going to tell me that a 17 year old is a child I think that's absurd but it passed and it goes to show you one thing for Bronxites to get a load of this it goes to show you the power of Jeff Klein and the IDC. This is something that was important to them, and this is something that's, that passed New York State and became law uh, because of the IDC. Uh, the Senate Republicans had to acquiesce to this because of the power of the IDC. And I think it's important to recognize that in the Bronx, we have the Speaker of the Assembly, and we also have the head of the IDC, which puts us as New York, as Bronxites, in a very powerful position. So for those people that are attacking the IDC all the time and that are liberals, this is an example of how Raise the Age passes because of their support. So even with Raise the Age passing right now, you say, listen, it still deserves another look. I think if we're going to include violent crimes and simply include violent crimes that involve weapons, I think that's a mistake. But then you're talking about the fact that also that New York is probably one of those two states that still is not in that category. We now are moving to where most of the country is. Well, I, th I still think it's a mistake. And I understand that um, different states have different laws, and that's fine. But I think that if you're a 17-year-old and you attack someone in our community, I think that you are, you are an adult, you've committed an adult crime. And let me tell you why. Penny Brown, uh, in 2001, was a mom of two that was attacked and raped while jogging and killed mm -hmm. by a 15-year-old. This 15-year-old went to juvenile detention and played chess and played PlayStation, the first edition, um, and got to see juvenile time. For the rape and murder of a mom, I think this is an adult crime. I think it's heinous, and I think he should have faced adult time. So when I look at 16 and 17-year-olds, I'm saying to myself, are you really telling me that we're going to allow these gang members in our community to just attack and, and create a violent atmosphere and hurt our people and tell me that a 17 year old doesn't know what he's doing because he's some sort of baby? I don't think so. But you know what? It shows you the power of the Bronx elected officials. They got this done. I disagree with them on this. I agree with them on a bunch of other things. Uh, but the Bronx is in a good place. If we want to drive an agenda, I think this is where you, where you want to be these days. It's where you cut your teeth. JC Belanco, as always, good to have you. Thanks for having Catch me. Catch you next week. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with more open. Stay with us. We'll come right back right after this.